What's up photographers? Welcome back to the studio. So uh, we've done a little bit of exposure work and we're sort of hunting this, you know, good exposure, or great exposure, perfect exposure photograph. And we're, you know, attempting to do a bunch of things in the studio with the hope that if we can master them here, you know, eventually we may be able to use this stuff um, out in the field. And so what have we learned, right? We've learned that in full auto, uh, our camera can only sort of see a fairly limited snippet of uh, what we'll call the dynamic range, right? The black to white spectrum. Uh, we've learned that unless you're paying pretty close attention to your light sources, um, you can kind of shoot yourself in the foot by not, um, uh, by not using the best light source or by not maximizing the light that you have, right? A single light source is a really bad way to get good exposure uh, because you're gonna have really deep dark shadows, really brilliantly bright. Highlights. Uh, we've learned that if you bounce light around your studio using uh, studio fill lights or even multiple fill lights, you can soften the overall shadows. We've learned that if you jump into Photoshop, you can actually use selective edits like layer masking to edit specific places in your photograph. But okay, so there is a way that I really like um, for doing this kind of work that. You know, you got to pay attention to all the other stuff, but seems to put a lot of a lot of power, a lot of control into the hands of the photographer, and it's using composited or HDR imaging techniques in order to take multiple photographs in a scene, uh, uh, one that maybe shoots right down the middle, one that exposes for highlights, one that exposes for shadows, and then composite them in Photoshop using layer masks in order to get the best possible exposure across the whole image. And this works in any kind of lighting. It works in really great lighting. It works in really poor lighting. Um, the only things you'll need will be some way to stabilize your camera. And then you've got to slip your camera into full manual mode in order to get control of your shutter speed and aperture. So let's talk just briefly for a second about what that means and what we're going to have to do to shoot in full manual. So this is usually a pretty scary territory for people, right? Uh, for example, uh, the settings on this D600 are, are up here on top, and if you're comfortable using full auto on the top here, every time you slip into M, the shooting mode M, you know, terrible things happen to your pictures. Way overexposed, way underexposed. You don't really know what's going on. You can kind of do this whole like click, check, click, check thing um, that you see a lot of photographers do, but, um, but really, kind of an unpredictable situation. Well, let's talk through what you actually have control over in full manual and, and why that's important. And maybe most importantly, how you can predict what's gonna happen in your image before you even click the shutter. In full manual mode, what you have control over are your shutter speeds, your aperture, and to some lesser extent, uh, still important, but your ISO. Now, let's just say for the purposes for our class, ISO, let's just kind of set it at 200 or so on your cameras and then not really mess with it much. It is an important part of what we can do, uh, but you know, in terms of controlling light, it's not where I'm gonna go as sort of a first, um, first attempt. I might kind of resort to modifying ISO if I really absolutely can't do much else with my shutter speed. Now shutter speed is, uh, is a part of your camera that's essentially going to, um, it's gonna control light using, uh, using time, right? The amount of time the shutter stays open. And then your aperture, think of your aperture a little bit more like the pupil in your eye that it's going to control light based on how wide open or how closed uh, the opening of your eye is. I can show you to this, I can show you this a little bit more easily using one of these older film cameras. So the lens pops off pretty easily and as I manipulate the aperture ring here, you can kind of see how that aperture opens and closes and it clicks, click, clicks through what are called stops or f-stops and those f-stops, um, I have a number assigned to them. On this particular lens, I go from an f-16, uh, which would be a really small opening to uh, all the way down, click, 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 click to a 1.4. That's pretty low uh, contain, um, considering um, a lot of the lenses you guys might be shooting with are gonna be in the probably 5.6, maybe 4.5 range, uh, but that's okay. What you wanna kinda pay attention to is not so much what these numbers specifically are, but where to go to find them when it comes time to adjusting the uh, amount of light that's coming into your camera. Now the shutter speeds are a little bit more difficult to show you, but I'll open up the back of this camera and what we see when we look at the back of the camera is the shutter curtains. What you see when you look at the front is the reflex mirror. If I load the shutter, 
and I have about a thousandth of a second shutter speed here. You can probably barely even register that in the video, uh, but what you're going to see very, very quickly are the shutter curtains opening and the uh, reflex mirror snapping out of the way. Now, if I really slow that shutter speed down, that was a thousandth of a second. I'm going to bring that all the way down to a thirtieth of a second. It should be a little bit easier for you to see what's going on back there. A thirtieth of a second is much slower than a thousandth of a second, but I can keep going. I'll go all the way down to one second. Now, one second is going to let in a huge amount of light compared to the one thousandth of a second that was just that I was just using. Now my shutter speeds stop at, uh, at a setting called B or bulb. Yours may go down below one second, or I should say maybe longer than one second, maybe two seconds, five seconds, 10 seconds, maybe 30 seconds is the basement of your digital SLR. Bulb is sort of the older way to do that, right? I would hold my finger down on the trigger, and as long as my finger's down, the shutter stays open. This would allow me to make 30 second exposures, uh, 30 minute exposures, one hour exposures, right? As long as my finger's on that trigger, or in this case, as long as I've locked the shutter open and then I come back to it and unlock it, the shutter stays open. Uh, now on the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, the upper end of this camera is one two thousandth of a second. So if you can kind of imagine the clock that I illustrated here, our clock that we're accustomed to using is a 12 hour clock, but think of that clock as about one second. So that every time you read a shutter speed, 500, 1000, 250, 150, um, think of those as fractions, one two fiftieth, one five hundredth. Uh, that way we're dividing one second into ever smaller or ever larger increments. Um, the bigger the fraction, the longer the time, the, uh, the more light comes in so your image gets brighter. The smaller the fraction, so one two thousandth, it's a very small amount of time. Think of that as a very small amount of light. Uh, light, in this sense, you can kind of imagine as a quantity, right? as the photons actually come into the lens and accumulate on the back of the camera, either that's your sensor or your film, uh, it's, they, they soak it, right? They saturate it. More photon, more time, more photons, more saturated. Uh, so it's going to get brighter and brighter and brighter. This is very difficult for us to think about, though, because we perceive the world in a much slower way. Uh, one two thousandth of a second for me is, a, is equivalent to probably one one hundred and twenty fifth. Like, I'm not going to know the difference between those two things. Uh, but to our camera, that's a huge difference. Every click on your shutter speed is probably set to double or half the amount of light. Just moving one stop, in other words, doubles the amount of light. It's worth thinking about that, especially for a bit later. Uh, now, uh, manipulating the shutter speed and the aperture in this way uh, is specifically intended to control the amount of light. Now, they do have secondary functions, which we will get into later on, a pre on another uh, assignment. But just know this, adjusting your shutter does more than just adjust the overall amount of brightness or darkness. Adjusting your aperture does more than just adjust the overall lightness and darkness. However, for right now, what we're working on in this assignment with bracketing, we're not going to get too deep into depth of field or action, uh, stop action and motion blur. So let's just kind of set those things aside for a moment. So just knowing how to adjust shutter speed and aperture is probably enough to keep us busy for a whole class period. On my camera, for example, I have both a finger wheel and a thumb wheel. So on my camera is on and set to manual. My thumb controls shutter speed and my front finger controls my f-stop or my apertures. But how do I know what to set those at? Now this is where you see a lot of photographers click, check, click, check, click, check until they kind of get themselves in a ballpark and then they begin their you know true photo shoot. So they've kind of burned through five, ten clicks before they even kind of get to the real work. Um, is there a faster way? Well, yes. Built into your camera uh, is a fully automated light sensing system uh, that you can actually take a bit of control over. Uh, we call it the light meter. Now, the light meter is activated usually by depressing the trigger about halfway down. And so if I was shooting in full auto, what ends up happening is as I depress the trigger halfway down, the autofocus goes, went, went, it kind of finds what you're looking at. And then in that same moment, your light meter has sampled the overall light space of the scene. And once it senses that, it kind of knows what to do with your shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. It will take control over those and balance them all for you 
before you take the picture. Now, if you're real rapid fire and you don't spend very much time between the halfway down autofocus all the way down click, your camera has already made those calculations for you in a fraction of a second, which is pretty awesome. The slowest thing about your camera very likely is your focus. So that's probably if you've ever experienced a bit of a delay as you're trying to take a picture, it's very likely the autofocus trying to do its job. Uh, but what uh, but what we're going to do today is take a bit more manual control over that light meter. And so what we need to do is kind of imagine, kind of t start to think through where where can I find it? Where can I see it? In manual mode, if you put the camera up to your eye, somewhere at the bottom of the frame, you'll notice a little sliding ticker. So when you look through the frame of most cameras, right, you see something like this and some sort of focusing aid in the middle, and then there's usually a ticker down there at the bottom. And down here you might see th numbers like, you know, a 400. This is going to describe to me and my camera how many pictures I have left. You might see your shutter speed here uh, illustrated as just a number or maybe a fraction. You'll see your uh, aperture here and then Tucked in right here is this little graph looking thing that I bet you've never paid a whole lot of attention to. If I make that guy look a little bit bigger, for example, looks something like this, where I have a couple of uh, numbers in there, likely a one and a two. Those would be your positives. And then a negative one and a negative two. Uh, this light meter is essentially kind of a graph. As soon as I take a light meter reading in my image, remember light meter readings are trigger halfway down, I should see a little light flash into my light meter grid and it's going to sort of align for me either toward the positive end of the spectrum, toward the negative end of the spectrum, or right smack dab in the middle or what we might call zero. Now your camera's sort of job, your light meter's job is to sense the whole scene and reset your camera settings so that it aligns with um, sort of a center weighted or kind of a, an average light meter space. But if you're in control and you haven't made the correct adjustments, your camera is going to tell you before you have even made the click, it's going to tell you, oh no, like you're actually one, maybe even two stops overboard. And, you know, some cameras will even tell you that you're more than two stops or you're way over. So say, for example, uh, I had a shutter speed that was way too high for shooting here in my basement studio. A thousandth of a second, thousandth of a second, way too fast for shooting here in the studio. I'm going to be really, really dark. It's going to show me that I'm not just two stops underexposed. I'm probably ten stops underexposed. And so I am going to have to change my aperture and shutter speed until my light meter hovers right about there in the middle. Well, that's still only going to give me my center weighted exposure. How do I do this bracketing idea where I expose for the shadow and then I expose for the highlight in two separate pictures? Well, here's a bit of a trick, right? We're going to kind of work with our knowledge of the limitations of our camera. My camera can't see highlights and shadows at the same time, so I will force it to see shadows in one picture and I'll see highlights in another picture. So essentially, I'm going to choose to shoot a picture somewhere down here. I'll shoot one picture at, uh, say, two stops underexposed. Then I'll shoot another picture at, say, two stops overexposed. And your camera may have deep enough digital negatives that you can probably make those two photographs meet in the middle somewhere using a bit of editing. Uh, but what I'm going to do for our demonstration here is I'm going to then shoot a third image that's about right down the middle by shooting sort of a mid-tones photographs or what the camera assumes is sort of my, um, my average exposure and then exposing for highlights, then exposing for shadows. I can then take all three of these photographs, composite them together in Photoshop so that I am stuck with one image that looks to me and just about everybody else who views it like it was all done magically with one exposure. But you, the photographer, know uh, that that takes quite a bit of magic, right? It takes a lot more work to go from an okay exposure to a really excellent exposure. So let's actually set up the studios again, and, uh, and I'll kind of talk through what I might need in order to make this happen. Um, most of you guys, you know, you've kind of developed a bit of a preference now, whether you like your single light setup or your bounce setup. It won't matter. You can use either one for this project, and it will work out for you. Okay, so I've reset here. I've got um, sort of a hodgepodge of things from the other two videos. And if what I've got set up here really doesn't make much sense to you, uh, go back and watch volume one and volume two of the kind of exposure project. And I'll talk a little bit more in depth about what's going on with the lighting. But 
Um, I'm going to borrow uh, the bounce idea from the fill light assignment, but I'm going to cut the other bounce out for right now. I'm going to let some of the blacks really kind of come back into my photograph from my mono light project, but I'm going to make sure I don't lose all that detail. One of the other things I'll probably do uh, when I shoot my actual pictures for this assignment is I'm going to kill all the other lights in my studio. I don't want my video lighting interfering with my actual still lighting, but for the purposes of the video, I'll leave it on. The last thing we got to talk about is some sort of camera support. Right? If I set my camera right down on the table here, um, that's not going anywhere. As long as I don't bump it in between shots, I should be able to get two images or three images to stack perfectly on top of each other in Photoshop. Uh, but here's the deal, right? Since we're going to shoot for highlights, shoot for shadows, and then kind of shoot right down the middle, that's two or three images that all have to come from exactly the same position in space. So positioning on the table, it's not too bad. Uh, you just have to be careful that you have um, the right uh, sort of focal distance um, or sort of like this minimum focal depth, right? Like I can't get too close to my subject. My lens will kind of balk at me. It won't autofocus. And so um, I'm going to actually set it, uh, set up my camera on a tripod that's probably about 12 to 18 inches behind my subject. A tripod has a couple of advantages over the table. Um, tripods are three legs. They're super stable. Um, they also kind of have a lot more adjustability so I can get up above my subject and shoot down or kind of aim it. So um, I, it's not a requirement for the course. I didn't tell you guys you had to have one, uh, but we will talk at some point about the, um, about kind of what you might look for in a tripod. And, you know, I've got a lot of different types of tripods in my studio at home and a lot of different types at school, everything from kind of a 12 or a $13 version upwards, you know, into the hundreds of dollar range. And the biggest difference, one tripod to the next, is not the materials it's made out of, not the logo that's slapped on the side, but just stability, right? If it's a stable tripod, it's worth buying. If it's not a stable tripod, don't trust your expensive equipment sitting on it, right? It might be good for a smartphone or a microphone, terrible for a $2,500 camera, right? So the, the tripod that I bought and I've been traveling with for years now is just kind of this rock solid thing. I don't mind chucking it in a river or anything. It's just super solid. Um, it's not all that lightweight, but you know, I didn't want to spend close to $1,000 for a solid and lightweight tripod, right? So there are a lot of trade-offs. You notice that some of the tripods have a lot of hardware up on top, and some of the tripods look really elegant on top. Um, I've got a small ball head attached to the tripod that I'll be using here. Um, it's one of the smallest sort of ball heads you can, ha you can use on one of these setups. A ball head allows you to make all kinds of adjustments with just one lever. Uh, you'll see a tilt pan uh, tripod head that has a few levers on it, right, that allows you to move in just one axis. Those are really great for video work. Um, a little bit slower to use for photography. Uh, and then you'll see other things that are like pistol grip tops and whatever. Um, honestly, all that is secondary to stability. So one of the great things about tripods, too, is if you happen to use them often, is they come with these little base plates that you will plug into the bottom of your camera. And uh, just about every piece of camera equipment I've got floating around the studio has this little quarter-inch screw on the bottom that mates to base plates, that mates to tripod heads, that mates to all kinds of photograph photography equipment. It's pretty standard. And if you are into sort of doing DIY stuff, it's a pretty common thread. So you can just go and buy your own threaded rod and build out uh, camera rigs and stuff like that. It's really cool. Uh, but the base plate allows me to work quickly with my camera. So what I'm going to do here is get my camera positioned in just the way I like it. Make sure that I'm happy with the composition and the arrangement of my subject in the scene. Make sure that my lighting is right where I want it. And then I'll click through the exposures and sort of talk through it as I go. So as I am looking through my camera at this moment, my light meter is telling me that I am at least two or three stops overexposed. My shutter speed is one hundredth of a second. My aperture is 3.5. While I'm at it, I'm just going to double check my ISO and make sure that it's down in that 1 to 200 range uh, and then recheck my light meter. The reason I'm going to keep it low is because I have a lot of control over my lighting here. I'm also double checking to make sure that the quality I'm shooting is in RAW, right? So I'll just do one more check on the light meter. And because I made the adjustments with my ISO, I'm now just about a stop under, not four stops under. We'll have to have a conversation in class about the relationship of ISO 
to uh, to exposure. But for now, just know this: keep it at one or two hundred. Now, because I'm not um, I'm not going to fuss too much about uh, you know camera shake or anything. I the, the shutter speed really doesn't matter at this point. I don't have to be super concerned about getting motion blur. Uh, so any shutter speed will work. Any f-stop will work. All we're doing is trying to get perfect exposure. So I'm going to shoot just down the middle here. Now that I know I've got my base image, let's just check that composition, make sure I like it. That image is sort of my, uh, my average. Now I'm going to adjust my shutter speed or aperture. You choose. I'm going to choose shutter speed. I'm going to go a couple of stops up and a couple of stops down in order to get the best possible image overall. I'm going to go from 1 80th of a second up to 1 200th. And then from 1 200th, I'll go back down to 80, right in that middle, and then give it a couple clicks down, down to 1 30th. Those are the three images now that I will use and bring back to Photoshop for compositing. Okay, so here we are, maybe 15 or 20 minutes into the retouch in Photoshop, and I'm really kind of liking where this piece is at. And honestly, like when it came into Photoshop, the exposures were looking pretty good. I learned a lot in the studio about how to control my lighting so that my retouching is really, you know, fairly light-handed. And so um, what I may do is just kind of back this thing all the way up, just kind of throw this thing away and start it from scratch. Uh, when I go... Uh, when I go to the folder where I have these images saved, I'll just kind of show you quickly again uh, what I'm looking at when I pull these images up. Here is my overexposed, or two or three stops over. Here is my sort of right down the middle, uh, the, the exposure that my camera told me uh, was about an even exposure with the light meter. And then I took one more image a couple of stops down or a couple of stops underexposed. Uh, and so what do I do with these images? Well, let's let's start by just bringing that middle one straight into Photoshop. Uh, that, that'll be the sort of beginning one that we run with. Command-O opens it right into Camera Raw. Into Camera Raw, I did uh, my black and white conversion, and then I adjusted some of my global sliders here. Uh, I'm not trying to get too fancy with my edits on this middle one. Essentially what I'm looking for is about an average exposure, not too bright, not too dark. I know that I'm going to have some issues with this highlight up here. I'm already noticing that that's pretty overexposed. Uh, but every time I try to change that and bring that highlight in, I sort of lose the shadows where I want them to be. And so this is that negotiation, right? This is why we're bracketing in the first place. It's like just can't get both at the same time. I might be able to if my negative is really deep, tweak my shadows, tweak my highlights, and try to do a little bit of selective editing here. Um, but we just, based on what I know about, you know, the way my camera works and what it can capture and what I can't, I know that there is just sort of a gap, right? There's a gap between what I got and what I could get. So let's open this up into Photoshop. And then I'm going to go back to that same folder where I have all my images uh, stored. And I'm going to address this highlight issue right away. Uh, in order to pull detail into that highlight, I'm going to need my darker image. Command O, I'm going to open up that darker image into Camera Raw. And I've already done a few of my edits here, so you can kind of see that I've pulled detail into that highlight. I'm not getting rid of the highlight, I'm just opening it a little bit, right? Um, making sure that there's some detail there and it's not pure white. Uh, this is essentially the kind of help that we had uh, using Illustrator or using, you know, some of these uh, clip warnings in um, in Camera Raw help us sort of see in extreme cases where those might be, right? And the clip warnings are these uh, little triangles in the histogram. If I switch those on, right, it kind of shows me where I've lost detail in the image. Those can be very helpful reminders uh, to sort of keep me grounded, right, in case I'm really off. Uh, but in this case, I'm not really that far off. The image that I made is looking okay. What I mostly need to do is to pay really close attention to what's going on in that highlight open up. Now, uh, in order to be able to composite these two images, they can't be sitting in different files like I have them here. I need to get them into the same file. So I'm going to pull down on one of these tabs and float the image so that now it's a separate window. One is in the tab bar, one is floating. 
And uh, this seems a little crude, uh, but I'm just going to grab the photograph and drag it into the other image and drop it in. Now it's floating inside that other image, and you can see that it, uh, it came in as a second layer. Now what I like to do, instead of just kind of dropping it in random, is I like to hold shift as I pull it in. I made these images on a tripod. They should be totally in alignment. If I hold shift, it snaps the image in to be perfectly aligned at the edges, so that when I look at these two images, uh, even zoomed in, and this is the real test, right? Uh, do the edges shift at all? Um, looks like I have just that tiniest little bit of shift. I might kind of go in and show you a way to, uh, to tweak that. That could be a tripod issue or there could have been something else going on. Maybe my model actually moved. But if I have a completely stable imaging system, right, a completely stable tripod, I shouldn't see any of that chatter. So before I get too far into um, kind of tweaking and making that perfect alignment, let's actually just deal with the main issue at hand here. I want to get my, um, my sort of better of the two images sitting on top in the layers palette. Right now my background layer is locked, so it's not going to want to move around too much. Quick way to unlock it, just double click it and click OK. Now I'll move my best image or the image that I like the most, the best exposure, to the top layer and I'm going to address this kind of shadow issue, or the, I should say this highlight issue here. Now, the easiest way that we could do this would be just to get our brush out and start brushing into the layer mask, right? Now, a layer mask is not like painting directly into an image. A layer mask is a way to sort of cut through an image and see it. Uh, and see what's behind it. Let me give you an example here. If I just start painting with a black paintbrush with a nice soft edge and I turn off the photograph underneath, do you see how I see this checkerboard? What that checkerboard is telling me is that there's nothing there. Uh, I haven't erased the image. I haven't put a hole in the image or anything. All I've done is I was painting in the layer mask. Remember, painting in black, my black is down here in the lower part of my toolbar, cuts and then painting in white and I'll switch using the keyboard shortcut X to keep my uh, workflow moving quickly. White repairs. It gets really obvious if I go up to my control bar up here and switch to a, a hard round brush. Uh, hard round brushes are just a lot more obvious in Photoshop. I almost never use them because those hard edges are really hard to hide. Uh, but I will kind of just demonstrate right how black cuts and then white repairs. Try that a few times in your computer just to kind of get the hang of working back and forth between the two. I'm going to switch back to my soft round and, uh, and focus more on what I might be able to do with the brush itself. If I'm really good with the brush and I'm using brackets and braces to downsample that brush or downsize it, I could come in, maybe even lower the opacity of that brush down into the 50% range and carefully hand brush that little bit of detail in. And uh, and that can really work. I, mean, I actually, you know, I encourage you guys to practice with the brush because the better you get with the brush, it's probably the fastest and least kind of uh, convoluted way to do those sorts of edits. Uh, the trick will be to make these edits happen without making them super obvious. So I've been able to pull in that little bit of extra detail in the highlight and uh, I just did it with my brush. Not too bad. What I would like to be able to do is maybe uh, give you guys another option. After teaching this in class the other day, I was thinking, okay, like maybe there's an even better way to isolate just the highlights with something like an automatic selection. Well, we could do something like grab the quick select tool. The quick select tool should be able to find the hard, crispy edges of this object and, uh, and kind of give us a little bit easier way to make that selection. If I hold option, I can sort of push that selection edge around, uh, push it back, holding option kind of subtracts, just kind of letting go of option, uh, just sort of um, pulls, that, uh, pulls that selection line back and forth. PC guys, that's alt uh, to kind of get the alternate uh, selection. And if I was really careful, I could put that selection line right where it needs to be, right on the edge of that piece of paper. The quick select tool should find those kind of areas of high contrast reasonably well. And if I could modify that selection line, what uh, what happens is I can either add that selection directly to a mask by clicking the mask tool, or if that's a little bit too harsh, let's do a command Z on that. 
and, uh, and add a layer mask. That way I don't accidentally load the mask quite so aggressively. Do my quick selection and use the quick select as a brushing mask. Here's how that works. I'm going to use my paintbrush now and make a nice big brush and see how my paintbrush is only going to have an effect inside of my selection. That's a pretty handy tool for controlling uh, somewhat of an uncontrollable brush. I really sort of like the nice soft edge brushes because of how, uh, how gentle they are usually to, uh, uh, to sort of come into Photoshop and not have too uh, gigantic of an effect. But setting up a mask selection is a really handy way to sort of blend in some of those edits. Uh, but take a look at my edges here. Ooh, kind of ouch, right? I didn't soften my selection. I didn't modify it much. So I can really clearly see those effects. Okay, one more possible option for maybe a really nice, easy selection of, um, of this highlight here. And this is what, what I came up with uh, after doing a bit more thinking. I'm going to go to Select Color Range. And underneath Select Color Range, I can isolate highlights, midtones, or shadows. And so I can automatically sort of tell the computer, okay, look for those brilliant, bright highlights. And I can shift the range. See how in my, pre my selection preview down here, I'm getting a sense of how much or how little of that highlight is revealed. I'm going to kind of pull back my range and just grab the kind of bright highlight, paying pretty careful attention to this patch right on top of the form. And then fuzziness actually is uh, softening the edges of that selection a little bit. I'm going to leave that down for now and click OK. So see how it automatically made that selection for me? That's pretty handy. Uh, I don't want this big patch of selection on the ground. So I'll go back to my selection tool, keyboard shortcut quick select, hold alt on a PC or option Mac, and just kind of remove some of those extra selection windows, extra selection areas that I don't need. Oops, command Z, got a little bit too excited there, pulled out too much. And uh, that way I'm just gonna focus my selection on this highlight, this problem highlight, and I can take any selection and automatically load it as a mask by clicking the mask tool and it automatically drops it in. Um, immediately, that looks like a big oops, right? Exactly the opposite of what I want. But grab that layer mask, do a command I invert, and it sort of uh, shows me about what I wanted to see, right? It added that kind of darker, uh, um, darker strip photograph underneath. Uh, it's a little bit aggressive, right? So I could uh, walk that back a little bit. I could kind of lower the overall opacity. Or maybe more importantly, I could flip my layers around. I'm going to stick layer 0 down on the bottom, move that layer mask up to the next layer, and I can uh, invert the layer mask one more time. So essentially, I've just kind of inverted the effect. Instead of removing that patch, I'm adding the patch to the top of this layer, and I'll duck the opacity. The opacity is just sort of the way that um, uh, I can sort of thin this out. And I'll lower it down just to the point where I can see the detail. I'm not completely gone, right? I'm adding a bit of texture to that paper. This is really subtle work, guys. Uh, we're kind of being pretty careful, pretty picky about this. Then I'll come back in with my brush and soften the edges of this selection so that I can't see it anymore. Somewhere down in maybe the 30% uh, opacity range and I'm going to work with white, switch it to black, and just kind of brush over those areas, brush, 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 until I fade out the effect. Now that's pretty good. That added a little patch of actual photographic texture, not adjusting the exposure, not trying to pull more out of there, just bringing that patch in. Now that exposure is looking pretty good. If I wasn't, uh, if I had kind of crummier lighting in my studio, I might be concerned about bringing some detail back into my shadows. Um, so I would be bracketing for the high end. But if I go back to uh, to that photograph that I made in the studio, and just sort of take a look at uh, at what that might give me, let's just sort of take a look here. Here's my nice and bright photograph. This is the one that I exposed for my shadows, and I'll open that into Photoshop. and composite this one in by floating it using V, keyboard shortcut V is just the move tool, drag and drop that one in. And uh, I'm realizing that 
even though I was really careful to layer three exposures, it doesn't really do much to my shadows, not the way I want. And on top of that, it looks like I've got just the tiniest bit of camera jitter in there. So you know what? I'm not even going to use that third exposure. Uh, I'm happy that I made it just in case I needed to get some more detail in my shadows. But I think all of the rest of my editing from here on out is going to happen with my adjustment layers. So from here, I will select both of these layers in the layer palette uh, to do that. Click the bottom layer, hold shift, and click the other layer, right click, and I'm going to merge these layers. I'm going to add just a small amount of, uh, of contrast. I'll custom mix my own S-curve here, uh, making sure that as I add that contrast, I'm not losing detail in my shadows. Nope, that looks good. And then I'm going to add a bit of sharpness using the same high pass filter that we used in a previous assignment. Command J to duplicate the background layer. Go to Filter, Other, and High Pass. And in here, given the fact that I'm shooting roughly a 27 megabyte folder uh, file, I'm going to make sure I keep my radius at about 5.8. This may take a little bit of um, playing for you. Uh, essentially, though, all we're looking to do is capture the edges of our photograph of our object here. We're not trying to uh, add uh, contrast and sharpness everywhere, just on the edges and then I'll blend that adjustment as an overlay. Let me zoom in just quickly here to kind of show you what's happening there on a really close level. Uh, just kind of adds a bit of crispness to the edges and uh, actually I, I like this texture that it picked it up, picked up in the paper as well. So this is starting to look really, really good. Detail everywhere. Um, I've got nice bright highlights, nice dark shadows. Uh, I've got a really good tonal range across these objects. What I might try to do just for the sake of adding a touch more contrast to this image and really making things pop is do a Command J, duplicate that background layer one more time, and then blend that layer as an overlay. And that got a little too crunchy. I think I lost a few too many of my blacks. I'll duck the opacity of that layer just a bit. And now we're really kind of starting to play with interesting edits to sort of customize how much uh, contrast I can add. Now this is starting to get uh, into this sort of area of personal preference. As long as I've got good detail in all of my um, good detail in all my shadows, good detail in all my highlights, uh, a little bit of extra contrast versus a little bit flatter image. Uh, that's where you guys are going to be able to start to bring some of your own personal taste into this. Um, I'm excited to see how you guys edit with this. I'll catch up with you in the studio and help walk you through this process in person.